Welcome to Cultural Values and How They Frame Horticultural Norms. It's the fourth learning session in the series that Seoul has been hosting, exploring the role of horticulture in cultivating social and land equity. Um, like much of Seoul's work, this series has been made possible in part through the generous support of Gaia College. Um, and they do help promote the practice of land care through education and they offer online courses uh, every semester, three times a year um, and some pretty good stuff actually, having taken some myself. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Sundora Alford Purvis and I am here this evening in my role as the Executive Director of Seoul. And I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, Ontario, where I live and work on unceded Algonquin lands. The format of this evening is a panel discussion with Aaliyah Frazier, Lorraine Johnson, and Tiffany Travers. Each will be opening with a presentation, and that will be followed by a panel discussion, and we'll finish with questions from the participants. So please do go ahead and post your questions into the chat, and then uh, when we get to that portion of the session, I'll read them out to the panelists. And I will be introducing each of the panelists as they're ready for the presentations. So. Um, Alia, are you ready for your presentation? Okay, uh, so I will read out your intro. Uh, if you want to go ahead and start screen sharing at any point, oh, you can. So Leah Frazier is an urban planner and soon to be farmer currently living in Kitchener, Ontario. She graduated from the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environment with an undergraduate degree in planning and afterwards worked as a private land development planner for a year and a half. She's a creative and critical thinker who has always had a passion for growing, cooking, and eating and thinking about food. This year, she is starting Lucky Bug Farm, a small-scale market garden that is set on growing a just and sustainable food system. Okay. Hello, everyone. Nice Hello. to be talking to you all today about um, publicly, or sorry, privately owned public space, also known as POPs, and the problem with these and other semi-public spaces. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement of my own, which is that I am living in Kitchener, Ontario, which is located within the Haldimand Tract, lands that were granted to the Six Nations of the Grand River in the late 1700s. These lands are also the traditional territory of the Mississauga, the Haudenosaunee, and neutral people. And I do want to make it clear that the Six Nations Reserve in Brantford covers only 5% of the lands which they were originally promised and granted. POPs exist in the space between the public and the private realm. They're privately owned, technically private property, but the public is still welcome to access them. In reality, POPs are often highly surveyed, surveilled and access to POPs is either granted or denied by building security guards, you know, the ones who are usually sitting in the front lobbies of these condos. And I think what you have with this gray area and these semi-public and semi-private spaces are the perfect conditions under which marginalized people are likely to be discriminated, discriminated against and harmed and experience physical violence often at the hands of these security guards or even the police. To illustrate a little bit more about this point and about this issue, I'm going to talk about the experience of Robin Mazunder, who is a University of Waterloo PhD candidate in the Faculty of Environment. Um, I met him a couple of times. Um, he's a cute guy. So he was visiting Toronto in 2019 to collect data for a then upcoming experiment. And so he studies the physical, sorry, he studies the psychological effects of skyscrapers on our mental health and on us as people. So he was taking pictures of skyscrapers in the downtown core. Shortly after he started taking pictures while standing on the sidewalk, he was told that he wasn't allowed to do so because he's not allowed to take pictures of private property. So I think he, question that security guard a little bit, trying to figure out exactly where public space ended and private property began, but he started to feel unsafe and he wasn't really getting anywhere in this discussion. So he moved, he went to another building and I think this one was on King Street. Started taking pictures 
And very quickly after he started taking pictures at this location, he was stopped again, questioned by another security guard, told that he could not take pictures of the building. When he questioned why he could not take pictures of the building, I think, you know, security guard number one comes out and then security guard number two comes out and they kind of give him these non-answers. And instead of fighting them, he left and he wrote this piece about it. And this piece is really the thing that kind of, I don't know, started connecting the, the dots for me, the dangers of having these spaces that exist in the gray area between public and private. And so if this man who is brown skinned, but is very clearly middle class is experiencing, you know, is being excluded from these spaces and is not being permitted to simply take pictures of these buildings. I think it's pretty easy to imagine how, you know, a poor black person or someone who doesn't have access to permanent housing would be treated in these spaces and would experience these spaces and how they would feel in these spaces. So we have an issue here. So in his piece about his experience, Robin says that you don't know why you're being treated the way you do or the way you are. That's part of the psychological burden of being a person of color. Um, but yeah, pops represent just increasing private power in our cities and eats into our public spaces slowly but surely and how these lines between which spaces are public and which spaces are private are just continuing to get blurred and in these gray areas marginalized people are experiencing significant structural violence and often physical violence just for existing and this is I think even more pressing for street involved people, especially in a time where we know that they don't have many safe options for housing. So this is pretty heavy. I understand that, but I wanna summarize. Pops, oh, sorry, the city of Toronto <laughs> doesn't have the resources to provide or care for new public spaces, especially in the downtown core. And they approve objective guidelines that don't consider equity or sustainability in the conception and you know securing of these spaces from developers and as a result developers are allowed to build own and maintain private active spaces that the public can access um, and then you end up with these privately owned public spaces that are highly surveilled by security guards these security guards are allowed to make the decision of which public is allowed to use the spaces. And then these are spaces, these become spaces where already marginalized people are excluded or harassed or harmed with very little recourse because it's private property at the end of the day. So I think, um, I think that these gray areas are really dangerous and yet they're really normal. And if you look on the city of Toronto's mapping of POPs, you can see that there are more and more being planned. And I just think that we need to imagine better uses for these spaces and uses for these spaces that benefit everyone and that benefit our environment and that speak to the indigenous history of this land and through mutual aid initiatives like community kitchens and community fridges like i really do think that these spaces can be made better um, i think that there's so many opportunities in these spaces like there's organizations that are already acknowledging that they're underutilized spaces in our cities like plaza pops which last summer created a community gathering space in and I think it was a parking lot of a plaza and it went really well so there are ways to partner with landowners and partner with the city to make these spaces more useful um, I just think it takes the will to do that um, and to conclude I want to state that even if pops are privately owned 
I think that there should be mechanisms that give the public control over how they are used and reimagined. I think it's really important that Black and Indigenous people and people who are without access to housing are in charge of this reimagination. And I also don't think that this should be just limited to POPs. There are so many spaces in our cities that can be safer and more sustainable and more useful for everyone if we really take a hard look at them and kind of set them free. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, there was a request in the chat that I actually, if you have the link to the article you mentioned um, about oh, yeah. that experience, can... somebody asked if, if you could share that. And um, I can also say that as you were talking about walking around taking photographs in Toronto, part, one of my side trips in my education, my education is actually in architecture, which mm. included field trips to Toronto, where I walked around Toronto and took photos of buildings and you know, nobody asked me anything. I went inside lobbies of buildings and took photographs and nobody stopped me. So there's a bit of a contrast of experience there. Yeah, people um, experience the city really differently based on how they look. So I just want people to think yeah. more about that. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, all right, so Lorraine, you're up next. And let me just get your bio here. So um, it should be set up if, for when you want to screen share. So you can go ahead and do that when you're ready. Uh, I see something pop up. All right, and 